He applied for a patent. He was denied because he used the term cold cathode ionic tube in his patent application. The patent examiner that actually reviewed that patent denied it because he said, as we all know, a cathode requires heating. He didn't even try to judge it on its merits just based on the name, cold cathode ionic tube. Two engineers from Bell Labs went to visit Moray. He, had, he was sharing information openly. He was doing public demonstrations. And he pretty much taught them what he was doing. They went back to Bell Labs and they built prototypes. Once they had it figured out, they visited him. One of them took a hammer and smashed his prototype because they knew he couldn't afford to build another one. They filed for a patent on the transistor and they got it. Same device, just, you know, he didn't have the wherewithal to try to choose a name that was proper for what he was doing. He tried to equate it with the actions of an ionic tube. Um, Bob, you've been really kind to describe longitudinal scalar energy to me and many other people. And now that you're mentioning Thomas uh, Mori, um, uh, T. Henry Mori, he basically um, uh, also had uh, uh, an over-unity output which Bell Labs did not duplicate or at least did not release to the public. Uh, my question is, there are special materials that you've um, categorized or classified or uh, put on your shelf as mentally knowing these work with longitudinal scalar energy and the others don't. That's and I gather that this type of energy is the kind that we would like to use if we want clean energy generators to be available for the future that yes. don't pollute. So uh, can you give us a grocery list of materials to at least experiment with, like germanium, you said, and a few others, that at least would help some of the experimenters in the audience? Well, you need, as far as a semiconductor, you need a, a semiconductor crystal that is reactive to the type of energy you're trying to harvest. And as Tommy, Thomas Henry Moray had learned, germanium was one of those. As you probably are aware that germanium went out of favor with the advent of the silicon semiconductors. They went to that because of cost, but I think they went out uh, to that uh, because of other factors as well, because of the energy harvesting capabilities of germanium. I don't know how many people uh, remember the crystal diode radio, required no battery. They also, during that time, and I actually built one, was an amplified crystal diode radio that required no battery by using uh, extra junctions to collect power to run an amplifier transistor, you could run a speaker without having a battery. Okay? Try doing that with silicone. Right? Um, as far as there's other chemistry requirements, like, like uh, Thomas had said, and I haven't delved too much into that, um, there are types of capacitors that behave as resistors. I didn't go into detail. I had to try a bunch of different types of chemistry of capacitors and rectifiers, you know, diodes, in order to find ones that were compatible with the energy. Yeah. I've blown out 1,200 volt, 400 amp IGBTs uh, trying to use them to do switching, whereas I settled on a simple little IRF 540Z lead free PBF that happens to have the right characteristics and is compatible with the energy. So I use those pretty much for everything. But I will tell you this, and I will caution you on this, when you use this stuff, you must be careful. This is why the battery smacker is a single phase device, why Nikola Tesla did not bring out any three phase device along this line. Everything he did was single phase because when you put this into rotation, there are special effects that happen, one of which is that you can create a rotating field as you move this energy. It exhibits frame drag on matter. So if you create a rotating vortex of energy, and that vortex of energy is from above to below, you can spin up the clouds, you can spin down the clouds, but you don't want to allow that to run away. Bad things can happen. So it's not really safe. Also, 
there's a limited amount of energy available in an area. These things will interact if you get them too close together. It's best to use this type of power system distributed so that you don't have too much power drain in any one area because as the energy flows, again, frame drag upon matter occurs. So you can drag in, if you were to draw enough energy, you could drag in weather patterns towards the location of that energy drain. It could affect the energy balance of the planet. So it must be used responsibly. And I didn't want to be the one to um, be responsible for some cataclysm occurring because of irresponsible use of this technology. Uh, Nikola Tesla had published, uh, had, had applied for a patent. He called it the magnifying transmitter because of the effect of harvesting the energy and getting the extra energy. When he was trying to get his Wardenclyffe Tower finished, J.P. Morgan's assistant, his advisor, told him, told J.P. Morgan, that Nikola Tesla was trying to give away free energy. And that kind of ticked off J.P. Morgan, and he shut off the funding. That's not what Nikola Tesla was trying to do. When you send energy wirelessly, you can put a meter at the point of the power being sent, and you know how much you are sending. What you don't have control over is how much nature is going to add to the other end. So Nikola Tesla felt it was only fair to charge for the power that was actually being sent not what was being received. So there would be some free energy coming in with that. But because of you know, what had happened with J.P. Morgan and uh, you know, Tesla ended up giving back his shares in Westinghouse, so he essentially was penniless at that point because he didn't want to break uh, J.P. Morgan at that time. Well, I can't go into a lot of detail, but after that, Nikola Tesla went to work uh, for the military, helping them with technologies, weapons technologies, developing. And uh, the rest of that is history. There was a lot of projects he was involved in. Go ahead. Uh, I guess one last quick question. Did I hear you say that running current through a coil would inhibit or disrupt the non-Hertzian energy. Yes, it does. Therefore, the question is, uh, in my experiments, I run current through a bifilar coil where the current flows in opposite directions, and I'm assuming Caduceus. that I'm generating, and I've done work with Caduceus Gold yeah. as well, yeah. I'm assuming that I'm generating a non-Hertzian wave from this kind of a coil. True or false? No, it's not a true non-Hertzian wave. It is, uh, it is called a suppressed wave. And that's where the magnetic field is suppressed. It's not a, it's not a true non-Hertzian wave. And by the way, just so you know, and anybody that wants to try that, it is actually against the law, and it's violating FCC regulations to produce damped wave emissions, which means transmitting energy using um, canceled, magnetic canceled waves, because it can interfere with things that they typically define as weapons technologies, scalar. Now, a scalar event, just because you're doing something non Hertzian doesn't mean it's scalar. Scalar is where two or more waves line up so that their amplitude hit at a point at the same time and creates a, a, a higher impact, a higher point. So two or three or more waves can be fired from different locations at different timings so they arrive at a target destination at the same time creates a scalar event. That's the entire basis behind scalar weaponry. I'm not going to get into that because that technology is classified. It's been around for a long time. Nikola Tesla helped develop it and give it to the, the military. Uh, I may not agree with you know, some of what they've done, but it's not my place to break classification. All right. Thank you very much, Bob Boyce. Thank you. If, if you all want to come up and look at these devices.